Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to worship today. Welcome to First CRC. It is good to see you. It's good to be together. And if you are here uh, in the sanctuary, a warm welcome to you. Maybe you're watching online and we say hello to you as well. As a church family, uh, we gather together and these are important times. And we know that our, our lives continue on through the week. And there are many things that happen uh, through the days in between our times here on Sundays. And this morning, just to uh, let you know uh, about a few of those things and uh, to be in prayer for these items. And they are, as they often are, mixed with joy and sorrow. And so first, we, uh, we mourn the loss of Jim Woodwike, who passed away on Friday. And we express our sympathy to Irene and the family, the Woodwike family, many relatives here that God would give his comfort in this time of sorrow. A visitation for uh, Jim and with the family will be uh, on Monday, tomorrow night from 6 to 8 at Vanderlaan Funeral Home. The funeral will be here on Tuesday at noon and visitation an hour before that from 11 to 12 as well. So keep the Woodwhite family in your prayers. And then along with that, we rejoice in new life And we give thanks to God with uh, Troy and Emily, the birth of Sloan Emery. And uh, she is going to be in the hospital for a couple weeks probably. And uh, so we pray for her and that she will keep growing bigger and stronger. But we're so thankful to God for little Sloan Emery. And also with Levi and Kristen Scott and the birth of Weston Lee this week. So uh, we thank God for those, those new additions to our family. And we turn to God with all of those things and we say, Lord, you are the one who holds our lives. And, uh, and we come to him this morning in praise and worship. And to do that on this day that we are thinking about the sanctity of human life, I want to read some words from Isaiah, the prophet, that call us into worship. And these are important words. Isaiah 40, it's one of the best chapters, in my opinion, in the Bible. And here, speaking of God, it says this, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord, or instruct the Lord as his counselor? And whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him, or who taught him the right way? All these rhetorical questions. Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He is the author of life. He is the one we come to with our lives and worship this morning. And so I invite you, if you're able, to stand and let's join in worship together.
and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits before the throne from Jesus Christ the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth and all God's people said Amen As I mentioned, today is a Sunday that we here and uh, around the, the country recognize the, the holiness, the sanctity of human life. And this morning what we want to do as a group here is to read some words that come from a, uh, a document called Our World Belongs to God. And that was put together by some Christian reform folks uh, some years ago. We're going to read some of those words that speak to this issue of the sanctity of human life and then together offer a prayer. When we get to the prayer, we just invite you to to join with us as we turn to God and bring our hearts to him. And so, life is a gift from God's hand who created all things. Receiving this gift, thankfully, with reverence for the creator, we protest and resist all that harms, abuses, or diminishes the gift of life, whether by abortion, pollution, gluttony, addiction, or foolish risks. Because it is a sacred trust, we treat all life with awe and respect, especially when it is most vulnerable, whether growing in the womb, touched by disability or disease, or drawing a last breath. When forced to make decisions at life's raw edges, We seek wisdom in community, guided by God's word and spirit. Let's go to God in prayer together. 
Almighty God, we come to you today in the knowledge that it is only you that we live and move, and in you that we live and move and have our being. And we praise you, God, our creator, for your handiwork in shaping and sustaining your wonderful creation. And we worship you, covenant God, for the deliverance we have in the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, for the way you have rescued us, and for the gift of the gospel message that is ours to share with the world. We thank you, God, our provider, for the miracle of life and the joy we experience in the wonders of living in your created world. We confess, Lord, that there are dark places where we would prefer not to venture. There are times when you have called us to speak that we have chosen silence. There are places where you have called us to shine your light that we have cowered to avoid. Holy God, the pain and ugliness of abortion swirls around us. Its destructive power has harmed those in this country, this community, and in this church. And the realities of abortion continue to threaten the lives of many. Living God, as a church, we grieve with those touched by the brutality of abortion. We pray for the women whose lives have, never, have been forever changed, who are left with the scars, both physical and emotional. We pray for the men whose souls cry out in grief, but whose voices have gone unheard. And we also pray for the children who were never given the opportunity to breathe their first breath. Lord, you created us in your image and more wonderfully restored us in Christ. Just as you are recreating the world in Christ, Help us to serve as agents of your shalom. We know that you alone can bring healing and that you alone can conquer the forces of evil that work against us. It is in this knowledge that we come to you, not in our own strength, but seeking yours. And so convict us, Lord, as the church of your people to be the church. And we ask that those things that break your heart would break ours as well. Empower us, God, to serve as your hands and feet in our world, to sense the urgency you are placing on our hearts, to leave our nets and follow you, to proclaim the message you give us with both our mouths and our hands, to feed the hungry and to comfort those who mourn in order that no one who has an abortion would feel judged or alone, abandoned or overwhelmed. God of grace, hear our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This time, I'd like to ask the kids to come on up. We have a children's message, and Mrs. Snyders is going to share some things with you and all of us. So come on down, all the kids. You can have a seat right on the steps. Come on down, see what I got. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so glad you're up here with me because I have things to tell you about today. Come on over, sit on down. Hi. <laughs> Come sit back around. Today I want to talk to you about masterpieces. Now masterpieces is something very special of great value that somebody made that costs a whole lot of money. And when I went to my computer and I typed in priceless masterpieces, look what came up. Oh, back up. <laughs> Look what came up. Oh my goodness. I think that was a mistake. That might be priceless, but it's not a priceless masterpiece. But look what really came up, since somebody already gave the clue. This is a painting, the Mona Lisa. You are right, good job. This is a painting that somebody took great care using their paintbrush. And if I wanted to buy this, it would cost me a lot of money. I don't even know if I had enough money to be able to do that and if people would even let me buy it. 
Well, there's other things that, not just necessarily paintings, but other things could be masterpieces too. So I brought this along. Do you guys know what this is? Play-Doh. Play I'm sure you guys all love to play with Play-Doh, don't you? No, you don't like to play with Play-Doh? I know you do, yeah? So, when people make something like a fancy painting like that, or if they create something, just like Play-Doh, when you guys start playing with your Play-Doh, you squish it and you mold it, and you make it into something really special. I don't know what you would do and what you'd want to make. Sometimes I make snakes or snowmen out of my Play-Doh. You made a rattlesnake. See? And you guys take care and you do it. In the Bible, the Bible tells us that God is like, well, he is an artist. And he creates things. The very first thing he created was the world and man. And he took it and he molded and he made it very special. And then he also made it Eve, Adam and Eve. But he also created you guys. So some of you guys are big brothers or big sisters, and do you remember your mommy's tummy getting bigger and bigger because your baby brother or baby, s baby sister was growing inside of there? Well, God made that baby. He formed it, the Bible tells us. He knit us together in his mother's womb. He knew exactly what color eyes you would have, if your hair was going to be straight or curly, if you're going to grow up big and tall, if you look like your mommy or your daddy. It says he made us in his image, in his likeness, and you're so precious to him. And you have great value, just like that painting up there. So I want you guys to remember that today, that each one of you guys is special. And just like when you play and you mold all in your Play-Doh, God molded you and made you, and he loves you very, very much. Well, today's a special day, as we heard already, and we're thinking about people who are maybe going to have a baby, and there's some special things that we can do as a congregation. Last week, I put in everybody's mailbox a piece of paper that tells us all the different things that are going on. But I'm just going to let you guys know, and the moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas out there, about what our church is doing and how we can help. One thing is Right to Life, and we can make a donation to Right to Life. I put a box out there on the Welcome Center, and look at some people already put money in it. There's money inside here probably, or a check. And that's how we can help. There's also, I don't know if you noticed when you walked in, but did you see these on? These are baby bottles, and they're for Positive Options or Lakeshore Pregnancy Center. And it's right here, right by Allendale, by Grand Valley College. And people who are going to have a baby can go in there, and they'll show them a picture of their baby, and they will... Yep. Yeah. And we can help by putting money inside of here. So if you guys can go around, find change around in your house, or ask your mom and dad if you could do a chore, and you fill these all up, and then you bring them back to church next week or the next. Okay? It's another way we can help. Well, Positive Options also gives things to the moms that come into there. So somebody nicely already put in my crib out there. Did you see the crib set up out there? Somebody already put something. So you can go to the store with your mom and dad, and you can buy things like baby bottles or little outfits or diapers, and then they will help those, those moms who are having their baby by giving them a nice little nice present. That would be very nice. So there's different ways that you guys can help support life. Yeah, your brother's up there. Look at that. So I want you guys to remember today that in the Bible, it tells us that God made you and that you are special and that you are very valuable and that you are in uniquely created by God. None of you look the same. So can you guys help and support life today? The candy that I have, probably for the big kids, is what? Lifesavers! So you guys can grab a handful of lifesavers because you guys are going to be, uh, be lifesavers and help, right? Okay. 
Thank you for coming up, little lambs. Should we do their blessing? Okay, can you guys help me with this? Congregation, what is your prayer for these children? And also with you. Okay, those who go to little lambs, they can have that candy because I'm not so sure. And then, um, then the big kids, after the little lambs are gone, then I will put the lifesavers out for you guys. And then after, when you guys are all gone, then Positive Options created a video for the big people to, to view when you guys are all to you back to your seats. Created for purpose, a unique genetic blueprint from the moment of conception. DNA woven together to determine gender, eye color, hair color, fearfully and wonderfully made. Valued beyond measure. Our culture says life is disposable, her rights matter most, it's not really a baby. And it's all one big choice. But God created us in his own image and whispered, I have called you by name, you are mine. In the United States, abortion is legal throughout the entire pregnancy, totally unrestricted. Most recently, abortion has been boxed up in the form of two little pills and a promise to make it all go away. What will you do to make a difference for life? How can you be a voice? Will you help save a life? There are over 2,700 pregnancy centers in the United States, serving men and women free of charge Created and full of hope, purpose, a providing pregnancy tests, from the life moment affirming of counsel, abortion recovery, DNA woven together to determine genders, eye color, many centers hair color, the first fearfully of and wonderfully baby made. in the womb. Displaying the measure. magnificence of creation Our culture says life and the is precious feats of a tiny Her rights heart. matter most. It's Perfectly not really formed and fashioned by the one. And it's all one big them. choice. But God they created serve us in faithfully, His own image. Love and well. Whispered, encourage. I have called you they by are hope dealers. You are mine. They need. In the United States, abortion is legal throughout the entire pregnancy, totally unrestricted. Most recently, abortion has been boxed up in the form of two little pills and a promise to make it all go away. What will you do to make a difference for life? How can you be a voice? Will you help save a life? There are over 2,700 pregnancy centers in the United States serving men and women free of charge and full of hope, providing pregnancy tests, life-affirming counsel, abortion recovery, classes, clothing, and diapers. Many centers offer the first glimpse of a woman's baby in the womb, displaying the magnificence of creation and the precious beats of a tiny heart, perfectly formed and fashioned by the one who created them. They serve faithfully, love well, encourage they are hope dealers they need volunteers your prayers and your financial support will you please give generously and help make a difference for life today
We'll be opening the scriptures, uh, reading from Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. That's found on page 1023 in your pew Bible. And uh, before we do that, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, again on this day your people have gathered here, Lord, and we are grateful and thankful to be in your presence. And Lord, I pray for that uh, spirit that is in each one of us to give us a a calm right now, uh, to help us to be thinking about you. Lord, I pray for that spirit that helps us all to be unified, that helps us to live fruitful lives, to come over us. And I pray for that same spirit, Lord, to be over Pastor Dave, your servant, Lord, as he has studied your word this past week. Oh, Lord, that he would be able to to lead us and speak to us by your power. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Again, Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6, unity in the body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient Bearing with one another in love, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tammy, as well, for being a champion for, for life here. If you have any questions about any of the stuff you've heard this morning or seen on the screen with regards to sanctity of human life, uh, Tammy is a great resource to go to. And that's going to come up in our message as well. It's going to be sort of the, a backdrop of our message and the scripture passage that we're going to unpack together. But this morning, what I want to think with you about for just a few moments is you know, this divine design for dealing with difficult let's say, individuals. And I don't know if you can look at your life and identify anyone that you would say, well, they are kind of the difficult person in my life or the difficult people in my life. And you're all looking at me right now. And so maybe, uh, yeah, sometimes pastors can be that, that one And you might be sitting right next to a person who might be a bit difficult in your life. If you you wonder what it's like to have a difficult person, I've been told you just have children and you will find that they can be incredibly difficult. They know how to push your buttons and get you going. But it might be a coworker, someone who is like, uh, you know, nails on the chalkboard. They just annoy you. It might be the pessimistic person who is just this sort of black hole of negativity, and every time you get in their orbit, it just drags you down. Again, it might be a family member. It might be someone who is very close to you. It may be someone who, uh, you know, it's not just someone who is kind of annoying, but it's deeper than that. Someone who has a, a personality disorder someone for whom you are providing care and, and they're not trying to be difficult, but it's just a difficult situation. It might be someone you know who's involved or caught up in some addiction and that whole aspect is just creating this difficulty and, and how, do you, how do you deal with that? So I'm under no illusions that, that anything that I'm going to say Again, drawing from God's Word this morning is just simple or easy. It is absolutely not, especially when we identify those difficult people in our lives. And here's the thing, uh, that difficult person may be you. And in fact, probably is. Someone has probably identified me or you as a difficult person. Howard Hendricks was a... a a preaching professor, well-known and a preaching professor. I think he passed away, but um, he said, you know, if one person calls you a donkey, just ignore it. Uh, But if three people call you a donkey, you better go buy a saddle. Uh, And you might have where a bunch of people are saying, boy, you are difficult. They may be right. 
they might be seeing something in you or me that we are blind to. And that can be very true. The difficult people in our lives, uh, what do we do? How do we handle that? How do we approach that? And my experience has been, again, in my own response to difficult people, is going to be much like yours. When you look at the, just the biological response, you get into a situation with a difficult person. Biologically, we either want to fight or we want to flee. Those two responses are going to be right there. And perhaps you've tried one or the other. Or those things will come together. And you are in your car and you're thinking about this difficult person and you are rehearsing in your mind or maybe even out loud talking to yourself uh, what they said and how you responded, how you wish you had responded and you're playing this chess game in your mind or out loud alone in the car and that difficult person is not even with you. But you are going through this whole thing You're not addressing it, but you're angry. You're trying to figure this out. How do I deal with this person? Or I wish I had done it this way, or I wish I hadn't said that. And then to add just one more layer of complexity, if you're here this morning, and I'm not assuming everyone here is a follower of Jesus, but if you are, that adds another layer. If you believe and have the convictions that we've shared this morning about the sanctity of human life, you say, well, yeah, I certainly believe that an unborn child deserves to live, and I believe that the vulnerable in our society or the elderly need to be treated with care. But what about that difficult person? Do your convictions or mine about the sanctity of every human life apply to them? And what about Jesus' words, those troubling words, when he says, pray for those who persecute you? Pray, bless them. Don't retaliate. Uh, Look at the log in your own eye before you point out the speck in someone else. All of those passages, all of those words of Jesus that come to bear and you say, okay, and I have all of that, so now what do I do with this difficult person? Because this is making it even perhaps more difficult to know how to, how to respond and how to relate to this one. Well, that's what we're going to think about together this morning. And uh, we are, as I said, in this series where I've entitled it Divine Design, looking at our lives, and specifically we're focusing on our relationships. And to say, okay, um, I could look at the blank canvas of my life and I could just freehand it and I could just kind of create it as I go, or I could see my life as having a design, that there is a designer, and I could, as we talked about the first week, instead see my life as a paint-by-number, and I could paint this life of mine by God's design and then see the beauty of it, the masterpiece that God intends for it to be. And so that's what we're thinking about together on these weeks. And uh, this is a little kind of a graphic that we've gone back to each time, and it's been helpful for me, I hope it is for you, to think of our lives, our individual lives, as having, uh, if you want to say, a vertical dynamic where we talked about that the first week, that if you're a a believer, your life, my life, it is found in Christ, right? They say, I am not my own. I belong to my faithful Savior. And God sees me with the perfect righteousness of Christ, and and I am found in him. My sin has been dealt with. My shame has been overcome. I am in Christ. And as I go through this week, that vertical dimension is always there. That's not the only dimension to your life. There's also... I have there in, that internal part of you, the the transformation that God keeps working on us, the sanctification, that's the word we use. And God, by his word, by his spirit, is always growing us, maturing us, developing us to become more and more of what he would have us to be, the most Jesus-filled me that I can be. And that's always happening on, uh, uh, in my life, even as I am focused on that connection I have to Christ. And then there's that outward dimension. 
where you go into this week and you have a purpose because of who you are, your identity in Christ and what God is doing in you. And God has called you to go into this world, not just to go through the motions, not just to be on autopilot. He has called you and me, as Ephesians 2 says, and he's planned this in advance. We are his handiwork, his masterpiece to do these good works that he intends for us just to show the, the grace and the love of God by the very way we act and speak. And so we go into our life with those, those dimensions the believer in Christ does. That inner part of us, as I mentioned, um, that's shaped Again, by God's word, by his spirit. But we also said it's shaped by, last week, other people. And we talked about last week how iron sharpens iron. Uh, In the context of relationships, God brings a friend and another friend together. And in that relationship, we we find that we're changed uh, through the the truth-telling, through their encouragement we become more and more, again, of what God would have us to be. Iron sharpens iron. That's so important. I can't go through the Christian life on my own. I'm not going to be the best Jesus-filled me I can be just trying to do it solo. I need you. I need somebody else to sharpen me. And my life story, and I'm sure many of yours, you would agree, is what it is because of those who have sharpened me or sharpened you. But... What about this? What about when this happens? And it's not a good friend that you trust and that you know they are looking out for your good and you have this good relationship, even though it can be difficult at times and they speak words of of truth that can, ooh, hurt. But as Proverbs says, the wounds of of a brother, you can tolerate that. But what about this? when you are head-to-head with a difficult person and you begin to realize that when it comes to relationships, I mean, the beauty of relationships, I mean, it's, it's probably one of the richest things about our, our lives, the other people in them. And it's where the most pain happens the other people in our lives when they are, for whatever reason, difficult for us. And you have both of those things happening all the time. The beautiful, the goodness of relationships and the pain and the hurt and the agony. The highs and the lows are both there. And this morning what we're thinking about is how that takes place even within the Christian community among those that we consider sisters and brothers. You know, someone said uh, the old statement, to live live above the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with saints we know, now that's a different story. (laughs) Maybe you've heard that one. It can be challenging at times, right? Challenging. So what does God have to say about this? Mark read from Ephesians. We've gone to Ephesians many times, and uh, you may recall me saying this, that the letter, Paul's letter to the Ephesians can be divided into two. Uh, chapters 1 to 3 are the first part, and they're all about doctrine and, you know, just this uh, good biblical truth. You might use the word, you've heard this word, kind of a $50 word, orthodoxy. Orthodoxy means right opinion or right ideas. And the first part of Ephesians, it's all that. It's all about the grace of God and what Christ has done. It's pretty pretty heavy, weighty stuff. And then chapters 4 through 6, it shifts. And Paul says, okay, now based upon all of that orthodoxy, all that right thinking, how do we move into it? Here's a word we probably don't use. Um, I don't, but ortho, right, praxis. P-R-A-X-I-S, orthopraxis, right acting, right practice, right doing. And those last chapters of Ephesians are all about that. Now, how do I take this this good truth of what Christ has done and all of that uh, wonderful doctrine and, and apply it to my relationships? 
And that's what we just heard, a bit of that from Ephesians chapter 4. And so Paul is saying things like this, and we just heard this, where he's talking about be humble. Now he is writing to these believers in this church in Ephesus, and uh, this is a letter to them about how to live. He says, okay, uh, be completely humble. Now, why would you have to tell someone to be completely humble? Well, probably because there was some arrogance at work in that church. Be gentle. Why would you have to tell someone, hey, be, be gentle? It's because they were being abrasive. Bear with one another in love. Why would, why would you have to bear with someone? It's because they're kind of driving you nuts. And you can't give up on them. Make every effort to keep the unity. Why would someone come here maybe on a Sunday morning and say, First Church, make every effort to keep the unity with that kind of intensity, every effort? They would probably say that because they were afraid that it might not be so. Or maybe there was examples of that unity being fractured. Right? Paul's writing to them this way about these things. So you hear these words and they sound beautiful and good and just sort of like, uh, oh yeah, be gentle, be humble. It's all good, nice language. But behind it, there is drama going on. If he's writing this to these people, that means there's drama. There is stuff that's going on that he's addressing. And of course there is, because anytime you get people together, where two or three are gathered, there will be a fight. There'll always be drama. And Paul is writing to these believers at what is a critical intersection in their life together. Paul had spent three years with the believers in Ephesus, and now he is writing to them uh, this letter with words like this. And it's a critical intersection because if these things are not put in place or in practice, that fellowship of believers could easily splinter and fall apart. And the effects of that will just have, it will just be wide ranging and long reaching. Think about that in your life. Think about the relationships you're in or that I'm in or that we have here together. What if, and I thank God for the unity of this church, I, I just thank God for it, and the elders do and the deacons do. We don't see everything eye to eye, but there's been wonderful unity through very difficult times. But what if there weren't? What if there wasn't? What if, we, what if we divided? What might be the impact on young people, on children who witness that? What might be the long-term spiritual impact? What about you and your relationships, whether it's family relationships or marriages or the friendships that you have? What if it splintered? What if it got ugly? What if it went sideways? be a critical intersection, how you handle it, right? Because the, the fallout, we may never even see how damaging it is, but it can be incredible and awful. And so Paul is writing to them, knowing this, like, you got to get this right because the stakes are high. So when Paul is writing to them, and it's helpful for us to understand what the situation was here before we apply it to our lives. But in that situation, and maybe you've heard this before, but there was a, a debate, or not a debate, there was a division between the Christians who came out of a Jewish background, like Jesus and the disciples, and the Gentile, non-Jewish Christians who came out of, um, you know, a Greek background, for example. And when they would look at one another, we know from these words in the New Testament, they were seeing the other group or the other people as difficult. The Jewish Christians had all of their Jewish background. They had those uh, dietary laws, circumcision. They had all these religious practices. The Gentiles come out of their Greek background 
where there was a multitude of gods, Jews, one god. The Greeks, they didn't have all of those dietary restrictions and all of that religious stuff. And so they're looking at things in different ways. And in fact, a Jewish person would say, there's no way I would go into the house of a Gentile and have a meal with them. It's just not going to happen. And if a Jewish boy or a Jewish girl would meet a boy or a girl, they say, hey, um, we want to get married. And they did. And the Jewish family, they would have like a funeral for that child. Right? They have gone, so to speak, to the dark side. And so there's this kind of a, uh, a difficulty, uh, this kind of a division between these two groups of people. Now, they're all saying that they are followers of Jesus, yet all of that background that they had was coming to play, and they were seeing one another as difficult. And again, Paul is saying this critical intersection, because if you don't get this right, if you don't realize that you are one in Christ, it is going to go off the rails. It's so important. And so Paul does something that I think is very helpful for us. It's helpful for me. He, in effect, puts the wide-angle lens on and zooms out and says, all right, let's take a look at the big picture. And there's much that we could say about this, but look, he goes back, or we're going back, to chapter 2. That's in that first part of Ephesians. And Paul says, remember, Christ himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Paul zooms out, and as he's looking at this situation, writing this letter to these believers, he's saying, don't you see the big picture? It's of God's grace in Christ who has knocked down those divisions so that you are no longer the difficult person. You are actually my brother, my sister in the Lord. And you think about you know, the need for that, uh, it's really the bad news, right? I mean, that, that me, you, every person who has lived all the way back to Adam and Eve have chosen to go our own way. Right? We're meant to be in relationship with God. We're meant to be in this uh, connection with God that would cause us to flourish and in that relationship to then flourish with one another but but that rebellion it's right in my heart it's in yours too it says now I'm going to go my own way I don't need you God we may not say it like that but we say I'm just going to start free handing my life I don't need your design God that's way too restrictive and in doing that we don't create a masterpiece, we create a disaster piece. That's the bad news. The good news is right there that, that God the Father sends God the Son into this mess. You know, he could have sent an email, he could have sent a letter, he could have sent some doctrinal thesis. But he comes in the flesh, in a relationship. to restore the relationship that was lost, that we might be reconnected to the author of life, the lover of our souls. And in Christ, as we said, in that vertical dimension, right, we are restored. And that changes everything about who we are and how we're going to relate to one another. And Paul's saying, remember that big picture. Like, remember it when you're face-to-face, toe-to-toe with that difficult person. Remember that, because that's going to make all the difference, and it does. I've got to say that just because that is true, that does not make us some um, perfect group of people here. We're in church on a Sunday morning, but as has been said, this is not a museum for saints. This is a hospital for sinners, and, and I'm one of them. This is a place filled with 
people who are still growing and who are broken in all different sorts of ways. And God is working on us, but this is not a perfect place, and we are not perfect people. We all come with a history. Some of us come with just incredible brokenness, uh, things that have happened to us or that we have done, and that's all there. It's all in the mix. Some people think, well, church people are just, uh, they're perfect. No, they're not. And that's going to make it messy at times. It absolutely does. And relationships are. And it's especially in light of that that we go back to that big picture that God holds out to us in his word of, of his grace, of the work of Christ in and through us. And so I go back to this way of thinking about it. Just in my mind, I often think, as I've said before, that there's a space between me and you. There's a space between you and whoever you're sitting next to, even if you're sitting right next to them. There's a space between you and every person. Some of you are uh, taking driver's training, and you get in your car, and uh, the the instructor is going to say, hey, you need to keep whatever. I don't remember what it is, but uh, the space between you and the, the person in front of you. Right, Because if you're right up on their tail and they hit their brakes, boom, oh, you're going to have a collision. Keep a space between you. I think that's true for us too. A space between a husband and wife. A space between friends. A space between you and the difficult person. And what do we fill it with? One thing is we fill it with prayer. And especially when we're thinking about the difficult person in our life. We fill that space with prayer. We, we recall some of what Paul was talking about with this big picture, and we remember, if this is a brother or sister in the Lord, you say, as you pray for that person, you pray that God's best would be done for them, and you pray that God would give you wisdom to know how to handle it. And even in that praying for that person, something happens. You no longer dehumanize that person. You actually see them as more human. And you begin to put your sanctity of human life principles into practice, even with a difficult person. And you say, wait a minute, that life, that life bears the image of his or her maker. Yeah, even that life. That space between is so important. Filling it with prayer, filling it with the big picture. Now, I've got to say just one little caveat because some of you are saying, but wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't know this person that I'm dealing with and I, and I probably don't. And I know some of us may have someone in our life who's difficult and they're not just a little annoying. There are evil people in this world. You may be toe-to-toe with someone who is evil. There are such people. You may be uh, toe-to-toe with someone who is, thinking biblically the language, a fool. And they're doing foolish things. And if that person is evil or if they are a fool and they are doing foolish things that are affecting you, there need to be boundaries. Boundaries. And that's not unloving. That is just something we have to do. Boundaries have to be set. And so for some people, we may, they may be difficult and we may be praying for them. We see the big picture, but we also are setting some boundaries. And we ask for help. We say, would you, give, God, give me wisdom. You ask other people you know, give me wisdom. Help me to discern. Help me to understand this. Because there are some people who are just trying to be difficult. Think about social media. Some people, someone will type something in social media, and you think, I'm just thinking, oh, wait for it, wait for it, because someone is going to pounce on this, and they're doing it. Why? Because they're a troll. They're a provocateur. They're just trying to stir up trouble. There are those people. Now, you can just go along with that, and you'll get wrapped up in that too. Wrestle with a pig, and you'll both get dirty. And the pig's going to love it. And so sometimes you say, I'm not going to (laughs) wrestle. I'm not going to wrestle with the pig. I'm setting a boundary. 
I'm not going there. So boundaries, absolutely. But what does Paul go on to say? And just to note this briefly, again, knowing the backdrop that there's certainly drama in that church in Ephesus, he talks about living with, with humility. And for you or I, as we think about going into this week, and maybe that difficult person is in your mind, you think, well, what does it mean for me to be humble? To be humble, first of all, means I understand that vertical dimension of my life that, that I am a a child of God, first and foremost. And I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to, I don't have to retaliate. I'm a child of God. I don't have to react. I don't have to get defensive. I'm a child of God. I don't have to bite on every lure that goes by. I don't have to do that. I can respond out of that calm sense of who I am as a child of God. And that's humility, right? Humility is also owning your part. Um, in any situation where you're like this with somebody, there's almost certainly, um, you say, well, the problem, here it is, you got 100%, there's a problem, and almost certainly, both of you share some of the responsibility. And you may only have 20%, you may only have 3%, but you own your part. I own my part. I say, yeah, um, what they did, that was bad, but humility says, I'm going to own my part, and I'm going to deal with that, and I'm going to ask for forgiveness, or, or I'm going to repent of it. I'm going to turn away from it. Humility does that. Pride says, hey, it's all you. I'm, I'm not the problem. You're the problem. I got nothing to, you know, say. It's all you. Paul says be completely humble. Be gentle. We've come across this word before, and we hear gentle, and we might think weak. That is not the way the, uh, Paul meant it when he writes about gentleness. In the Greek mindset, gentleness was strength, Incredible strength, but strength under control. Like a, a war horse, you know, just a strong, you've seen these big monster horses and they are just pure muscle and strength, but a war horse that has been trained. So all that that uh, horse's master has to do is just nudge it, tap it, and it will turn, it will move, it will stop. It is strength, but it is under control. That is gentleness. Paul says be completely gentle, not weak. Gentleness says, uh, look, I may be seeing this correctly, but I'm not going to blast you. If you don't see it the way I do, I'm going to be gentle. And there we go. And um, I think part of this, I'll go here with this one. Um, I think one of the ways that we we often deal with uh, difficult people is by creating a triangle. And this really gets at these last two ideas that Paul's mentioning of be humble and be gentle. And some of us will say, well, okay, I'm going to be humble, at least to this difficult person. I'm going to be gentle. But I've got all this anger in me, and I've got to go somewhere with it. And so I'm going to go to somebody else and talk to somebody else about my problem with this person, and I create this triangle. And I've got that no triangle sign up there. That always leads to problems. Look at Matthew 18. It says, now you go directly to that person. You don't go, if you have a problem with this difficult person, I mean, you can go to someone and ask for, for wisdom or discernment, but very carefully, not to gossip or slander or tear somebody down. I've heard people, um, and we've lived on the East Coast, and, and people talk about Midwest nice, and we're good at that. We're very nice people in the Midwest compared to other parts of the country. And people note that. And so we'll be very nice to somebody's face, but we can be vicious. I've always said, yeah, well, there's Midwest nice, but there's also Midwest viciousness, and we'll unleash that behind someone's back. And so... Paul is saying, 
No, be humble, be gentle. In other places, no, don't go to slander, don't go to gossip, don't do those things that's going to tear somebody down. If you have a problem, go right to that person. And then he speaks of patience. Again, if you and I are thinking about the difficult person in our life this week, these things come to mind. Maybe one of these things is going to strike you. You say, wow, there's a lot of stuff here, but maybe one thing strikes you, and maybe it's this one. Maybe it's patience. Uh, Neil Planiga said patience is sort of like the motor oil in your car. Uh, It doesn't remove all of the impurities. Those things are still in there, but it holds them in suspension. It just holds them and surrounds them so that they don't destroy the whole engine. There are times where you are patient with me and you just hold in suspension something I say and you think, well, okay, well, that didn't sound quite right, but we'll we'll be patient. And you might do that with somebody you know and you love. You say, I'm I'm just going to let that go. It's not that big of a deal. I'm going to be Patient, hold it in suspension so that this engine keeps running the way it's supposed to. Uh, Neil Plantinga mentioned that in a, in a sermon that our family heard years ago up north. And he used the example of, you know, when you're in your car and somebody cuts you off and, uh, you know, your hand is about ready to go up, you know, you've been, you know, peel the banana, you're ready to go there. And you say, no, and Plantinga would say, no, you... Uh, Imagine, imagine that person that just cut you off is your grandma. Or imagine it's someone who's just in a hurry to get to the hospital because they just got some awful news. Now, that's probably not the case. It's probably not your grandma. It's probably not someone, they're probably texting. They're probably just a bad driver, but just imagine it anyways. And it creates some empathy in you and it changes something in your heart, that's patience. You hold something in suspension so the whole thing doesn't come apart. So we come back to where we began, and you think about your relationship with Christ. If you don't have that, I'd say, what's keeping you from it? There you find your identity and that that sense of calmness and that sense of being able to approach whatever you encounter and whomever you encounter because you know who you are, loved, loved by God, a child of his because of what Christ has done. And you know that God's working on you and those things like patience and gentleness, they are a work in progress. But you're able to live out of that life in you, not with fear or reactivity. You're actually to live out of that love and grace, that big picture that Paul holds out to us. You see, I don't need to control somebody. I don't need to fix them. But I do need God to keep working on me. I do need that. And as you do that, you find more wholeness in your life a peace, a joy that a difficult person can't take from you. And that's how God calls us to live. And so as we end, um, I invite you to think about that difficult person in your life, if you have one. And as I bring us into just a moment of prayer, would you pray for them? And as you do that, Would you practice that space between you and that person as we've said? And uh, let's go to God and do just that. And Lord, we come to you this morning and we hear your word and we think of the people in our lives and we know that we are flawed and sinful. Lord, for that person who might be right in the forefront of our mind right now, that difficult person, oh Lord, we pray that we would and bring them to you in prayer often. And Lord, that we keep looking to your grace that has changed our heart and that we might respond to them out of that grace and not out of anger or revenge or retaliation. 
Oh Lord, we want to be ministers of reconciliation. We want to make every effort to keep the peace. And so, Lord, hear our prayer. We ask it in your name alone, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing the song, One People Here We Gather. God's blessing on me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn towards you now and give you his peace. Amen.